have your attention please. We are delighted to be here at the Dog and Parrot here in Eastwood and we'd like to thank uh, the uh, management and the team here for allowing us to be here tonight to help a very good cause which is Conductive Education Centre. And, and also while we're here tonight, uh, just for that good cause, we are a very, very special guest here this evening. Who's that? Who said that? <laughs> 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 well, we're going to go back in time, talking about um, not just life before four Clough, shall we say. Yes, life at, before Clough. We're going to introduce a man who has been voted into the 150 years 1 to 11 alongside Stan Collymore. What a great uh, really? to try, try to partnership that will be. Stan was very lucky, wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <probably. laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, this gentleman next to me has to be one of the greatest striker that this football club has ever seen. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Ian Storymore. Yeah. A little bit back in time, but back in the uh, 60s, you first uh, started off as a youth player at Scunthorpe. Yeah. And uh, how did it uh, come about you signing for Nottingham Forest? Right. Uh, actually, I wasn't born in Scunthorpe, but I was actually born in Ipswich, and uh, I was brought up in Scunthorpe. I, I've never even been to Scunthorpe. Yeah. Cool, blimey. I was, <laughs> I was pleased to get out of there, actually. <laughs> you know when it's like sort of three o'clock in Nottingham, it's 1949 in Scunthorpe. And you know, it's the only place in England where you can still pay for sex with chips at Scunthorpe. So, uh, that's... <laughs> That's what scum thought was like, actually. So I must, must say, I, you know, I enjoyed my time. And uh, there wasn't an awful lot to do. So consequently, I think most, most kids of my, uh, my age uh, sort of living in scum thought they wanted to, uh, you know, they wanted to be footballers, you know. And uh, everybody's dreaming those days because there wasn't much else to do, was there, really? So, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was very fortunate that um, uh, my father knew um, a scout that worked in... Uh, sorry, that lived in scum thought, but he was a friend of the... Uh, coach at the time, Joe Muller, and talk about the early 60s, and uh, went for a couple of trials, and unfortunately they took me on, Scott. So that's how I, how I got to, to Nottingham. And I must say I was pleased to get out of Scunthorpe and get to Nottingham. It was a fantastic place in the early 60s, really good. So um, during the late 60s, we were in the first division, and we were up against the likes of um, Matt Busby's Manchester United, who had uh, George Best and Bobby Charlton. And also Tottenham Hotspur had Jimmy Greaves and also Don Revis, yeah. uh, Leeds United as well. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll list these players out uh, who you did play alongside who were fantastic players and they were part of the squad that uh, were finished second in the first division to Manchester United in 1967. Frank, and I would say, and I would, and I would say, if I remember rightly, he was the key figure for um, Derby yeah, County during that time. Yeah. And also Terry Hennessy, Sammy Chapman, and also our longest serving player, Bob McKinley. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, some very good players. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't until quite a few years later that that team got together. I mean, uh, I think when I first joined the club in the early 60s, I mean, it was, uh, it was tough old football in those days. And uh, I came to Forest as a, I think probably seven stone weakling. And, uh, at the time, there was um, probably three people at the football club that really helped me. It, all, all out the 1959 uh, Cup winning cup. Uh, uh, fella called Johnny Quigley, some of you might remember. Jeff Whitefoot, who let me tell you, he's the only one still alive out of the 1959 uh, Cup winning team. Uh, you know, a great guy and I still see him. And the, probably the biggest influence on my career was Jack Burkett, who was the captain of the team. You know, he was, Jack was as hard as nails and... Uh, I think he saw a bit of, bit, bit, bit of something in me and he, um, he used to, oh God, in the afternoons he used to take me in the, in the gym, lift all the weights and, um, and then up and down the stand, up the terracing and, um, you know, it really helped me to, 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 to sort of uh, become more physical and, uh, which you had to be in those days, you know, I remember we, um, when I got into the reserves we used to play against the, um, the, the, the first team, I was only, what, 16, 17 and, uh, you know, some tough lads playing in the first team that, you know, one or two I've just mentioned. They had a, they had a right back called, I don't really remember him, but Joe Wilson. Yeah. Sandy from working, well, Christ. <laughs> was, was he ugly, wasn't he, Joe? He was like desperate down, wasn't he? <laughs> when he was born and passed, the nurse slapped his mother, he was that ugly, Joe. But, uh, 
And it, to be to be honest, he wasn't he wasn't the quickest, Joe. And I'm not you know getting any credit. I used to give him a chasing in the uh, in the sort of in the practice matches and uh, kept going by and sticking a ball in the box. And anyhow, this one time I went by him and st stuck the ball in the box, you know, and and he came in about oh I don't know five seconds late and he actually broke my ankle. And I remember him to this day standing over me and uh, you know his big ugly face saying, oh, "That'll teach you to take the piss out of me." And I thought I thought to myself. God, is, is this football? <laughs> I don't want to carry on, you know, but uh, after football, Joe got a job in a haunted house, actually frightening the kids, it was that ugly, but, uh, <laughs> but that's how tough it was, and unless you had that sort of physical presence and that mental toughness, which Jack Burkett sort of instilled into me, you, you weren't going to make it in those days, and um, as Scott quite rightly said, I think it wasn't until sort of the mid-60s that when Johnny Carey came, we managed to get a, you know, a half-decent side going and um, he brought in some people like Joe Baker, who was a fantastic player, um, uh, Johnny Barnwell from Arsenal, they, they were two great sides, and, and there's Frank Wigan, I think, had come from Everton, hadn't he? I'm just looking at those names down there. Terry Hennessy from Birmingham, who turned into a super, super central defender alongside Bob McKinley, who played there for years. And... Um, yeah, we created, um, you know, got, got together a really decent side and um, unfortunately, we'll probably talk about that shortly, is that uh, we didn't quite make it that following season. During that um, time, when you did finish runners up to um, Matt Busby's Manchester United, who had George Best, Bobby Charlton and all their names, yeah. how close were we to winning the league that season? Well, I think very close. We played the uh, quarter-final of the Cup against Everton and I think we were second in the league to, to Manchester United then. And unfortunately on that day, um, Brian LeBone, I remember a big centre-half from Everton, big dirty bastard, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he clattered Joe, didn't he? And um, to be fair to Joe, Joe was never the same player again. I remember, I remember going into the treatment room next day because I got a bit of a knock and uh, I've never seen anybody's leg like it. He, he, you know, his leg was the colour of my trousers from here to his foot. And, uh, you know, whether it was internal bleeding, I don't know what it was, but, uh, you know, he was never the same player again and we sadly missed him. And I'm convinced uh, that, I know it's hypothetical, but I'm convinced that um, if he hadn't been injured that season, we'd, we'd have gone on to either win the league or the cup. You know, we, we, you know, he was a great player, John, a, a good goal scorer, and uh, yeah, we, it, it was it was a big miss, and I'm sure he would have gone on to probably win something that season. Yeah, who knows what happened then? And then two European cups, probably. Don't you? <laughs> well, you, you know, it's, it's all happened. You never know, do you? You never know. My old mate Rob, oh yeah, I'll, uh, I'll tell him when I see him tomorrow. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, um, Johnny Kerry was the manager then, and um, I don't know what happened really, but um, you know, I say we, had, we got together some really decent players then, and um, why they decided to uh, sell those players on, I'll never know. You know, we had um, a great midfield player in, in, in Henry Newton. I mean, terrific player, Henry, very mobile, very energetic, could put his foot in, and uh, he went. Uh, I think Terry Hennessy went the following season, who was a very cultured centre-half. Uh, of course, Joe Baker was injured. Frank Wignall, who made all the goals for me in that uh, quarter-final cup against Seven. He was fantastic for me, Frank. Made me awful, an awful lot of goals. Real strong, physical sort of guy, Frank. Could look after himself. And um, for some reason, I just don't know why, that they decided to uh, move those players on and consequently. And that was the demise of the, of the football. We decided to go down and... Uh, you know, it was really unfortunate they decided to sell the better players instead of sort of getting one or two good players in again, you know, to, to sort of enhance the squad, decided to sell the good ones. So that was what usually happens, you, you start to decline. Today's football compared to uh, uh, football back in the 60s. Yeah. I mean, what was the wages like? Were they uh, incredible? <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, I'll, I'll come on to that when I'm probably going to talk about that facade at Derby. Though. When I'm supposed to sign for them, I'll tell you a little story about what Cliffy said to me about wages and that. But, yeah, they were great. I remember when we, when we finished second in the league and semi-final of the cup, we were on £40 a week and £4 for winning, £2 for a draw. And that was tax. So, it, I, know, I know it was, listen, probably in those days, what you're talking about, 68 ish it was, it was decent money, but it wasn't, you know, comparison to what they're getting now is... Uh, miles behind wasn't it so uh, but I think in those days you didn't really think about them. seriously you didn't really think about them I think it was just the enjoyment of playing in front of the Forest fans who you know were, firstly were fantastic to me and the rest of the team and uh, 
you know, you just look to go out there and see if you could do your best for them and, you know, score a goal and win a football match. And really, he knows it. I don't think the, uh, it was a massive relevance, the, um, the money, really. And what was the uh, training uh, like? Um, I mean, obviously, you had a great manager back then who got brought that team together, Mr. Mm -hmm. Carey, yeah. and he's. Um, and what was his tactical approach to everything? I mean, obviously, Johnny didn't have a tactical approach. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was one of the old-fashioned managers. You never saw him on a training ground. He used to um, uh, probably see him. I don't know, maybe a couple of times a week. He was always well dressed. Always wore a trilby hat. Never really wandered down a training ground. It was the old-fashioned way, wasn't it, in those days, really? And they didn't come on the training ground and do some coaching, you know. It was all about uh, Saturday, really. And, and all Johnny said was, fizz it about today, lads. That was his team talk. Fizz it about. So, <laughs> we fizz it about. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but he, I want to say he was a lovely man. He was a really, really nice uh, uh, man, Johnny. And, he, yeah, he got a decent side together and... Uh, Fortunately, I think it was just because of the board that uh, he probably lost his job because they sold the best players. Simple as that, really. And then towards the end at uh, Nottingham Forest, you were linked um, with loads of different clubs and um, Derby County was one of them. Brian Clough's Derby County. <laughs> I did say Brian Clough in there. You'd have to boo at him. But, <laughs> but um, you did actually... Well, you was actually yeah, paraded onto the baseball ground uh, saying that you signed for Derby, but what actually happened there? Ooh, a bit of a long story here. Well, I'll go through it if I'm not going to bore you, but um, yeah, what happened was, uh, as I say, you know, I was getting a little bit uh, concerned about, I, was, I think I was 27 there, that, you know, I'd like to sort of won something and they just, you know, as I said, they just kept selling all the, all the better players and, then, you know, I just thought probably the time to try and try and move on. But, you know, in a way, I was, I was really um, thought about Forest because, you know, they've been great to me. You know, I've been there since I was 16. And, but it's just, I think that... Uh, and indeed, I think at the finish, that they really wanted to sell me because I think they needed the money. So, yeah, there's a few clubs that were prepared to pay the... I think it was 200,000, which was a record fee in those days. 200 grand, bloody hell. You wouldn't get a ball boy for that now, would you? 200 grand. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so... Um, uh, oh... So it was Matt Gillis then, I think. Matt Gillis was a man. He called me one Friday morning. He said that, um, he said, I'd like you to speak to two clubs initially, he said, but there's one or two in the background if you can't agree terms with them. So I said, yeah, that's OK. Who do you want to speak to first? He said, uh, Frank O'Farrell at Manchester United. So uh, I think they'd arranged to meet him at the, the Ed Walton Hotel in, in, uh, in West Bridgeford there. And um, I, tur I turned up there, you know, all suited and booted, as you do, and... Uh, there was, um, let me think, there was Matt Gillis, the manager, came, uh, Bill Anderson, the assistant manager, and the secretary, Ken Smith, I thought I was going to sign for him, you know. But anyhow, they'd been tapping me upon the phone Monday night, and they'd offered me this. And so I said to Franco, I said, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I said, you know, what about... He said, well, I don't know anything about that. Anyway, we couldn't agree terms. So we go, go out to the foyer, and, there, and there's um, uh, the manager, Matt Gillis. I says... Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Gillis, I just can't agree terms with them, Manchester. He said, don't worry. He said, that he, actually, he actually said, I'll get you Brian Clough on the phone. So he rings the number. Um, I said, he said, I've got Ian Story Moore here for you, Brian. Right, he said, where are you? I said, I'm at the Edwalton Hotel at um, Westford. Stay there, we'll be over in 20 minutes, don't worry. Anyhow, I came off the phone, I couldn't believe it. And I said to Matt Gillis that he was on his way. And the three of them, boom, Gillis, the secretary, and Bill Anderson just, just left me on my own. So they go and shade the You know, I, I can't believe it. So I'm sat in this room, like, excuse me, I'm shitting myself, waiting for those two. I mean, Clough and Taylor are on the way, the prime of the career, you know, bullshit, you know, full of themselves. So I'm sat in this bloody room, suddenly the door flies open, in comes Cloughy and Taylor. Now then, he said... Yeah, we want you to sign for Dorby County. Well done, and you shouldn't have signed for those bastards anyhow. Man United, he said, you did well, well done. So let's have a sit down and talk about it. Took the jackets off as they do, you know, slung them on the bed, and I'm sat there, you know, for that. Oh, God, what can I do now? I've got to sign now. <laughs> so he starts, doesn't he? He says, we like to ask the players we sign a few questions, you know, about the private life. I said, well, all right, Brian. He said, uh, he said, are you a drinker? I oh, said, not, not really, Mr. Club. I don't mind a couple of glasses of wine with, you know, with a, with a meal or something. He said, what about smoking? Do you smoke? Oh, I said, I never smoke. Definitely never smoke, Mr. Club. He said, and what about a bird? Do you like a bird? <laughs> I, said, 
I said, no, I'm married, Mr. Cross. I don't, you know, when I was younger, absolutely, you know, of course. But no, I'm married now. I'm okay, thank you, yeah. And he said, what about gambling? Do you like a bet? I said, well, no, no not really. I'll, I'll foot on the ground. That's the I get with that. He says, Peter, we can't sign him. He's a fucking liar. <laughs> <laughs> So, 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 he says, I'm only kidding, you know, man. You know what I'm only kidding. He says, let's get down to business. Come on, he says, how much do you want? So I thought, well, I'm 100 quid a week at four. I said, I'll try and do all my money. He says, I said, I want 200, 200 pound a week, Brian. He says, 200 pound a week. He says, Ron McFarlane's not on that. I says, listen, Mr. Club, I said, but I'll guarantee you 20 goals a week. Uh, sorry, 20 goals a season, I know the That was good, wasn't it? <laughs> he, I, said, I, I said, I'll guarantee you 20 goals a season. He says, son, he says, if I want to guarantee, I'll buy a fucking washing machine. <laughs> Came to the um, oh, Midland Hotel at Derby, where they used to stay the Friday night before the game. And uh, so uh, Peter took me there. I'll go down, he said, to the city, I'll sort those bastards out. He says, I'll get it signed, I'll get it done. So I'm having a meal with the rest of the players at the Midland Hotel before they're playing Wolves next day. And he comes back about eight o'clock, Cluffy. He said, um, all done and dusted, Ian. You're a Derby County player. Lads, bottle of champagne, we've signed a new player. I thought, well, brilliant, absolutely. Good, good team at the time, good team at the time, you know. Won the league championship, brilliant. Anyhow, next day, I turn the radio on in my bedroom. It wasn't about, you know, the. Third World War started, it was about me not, you know, the deal had gone through, it broken down. I thought, that's strange. So, do, no, no, come down to Brett's and he's there, don't worry about it, I'll sort it, blah, blah, blah. He said, get down with Ronnie Webson, what's your youth team? You know, Ronnie will take you down, what's your youth team? So, it was pissing it down this day, and we were playing Wolves in the afternoon. So, I was sat in the car watching the game, of course, he turns up cluffy. I don't know why, he said, you two, out the fucking car, he says, and watch it there, he said, if you're not out the car in two minutes, you'll be playing for the youth team next week. So that was, oh, what have I signed for here? So anyhow, we get back to the ground and uh, praised me on the pitch, said, everything's done and dusted, blah, blah, blah. So uh, just give an insight on how tough he was as a manager, I walked in about two o'clock in the dressing room, as you, as you did, and I was there, we saw all the lads the best to look. There's Cluffy on the treatment table, socks off, shirt sleeves rolled up. I know there's a drop of scotch in his, uh, you know, in his beak having a drink, giving his team tour. They were all playing Wolves that day, and I thought it was really funny. He says, uh, right, McFarland, he said, he didn't call him by the first, he said, McFarland, he said, Dugan. I said, he said, I want him on his arse in the first five minutes. Ronnie Webb said, you're playing against a tricky winger called Wangstaff. I want him in the dugout with me, first tackle. He says, <laughs> he said, um, he said, Alan, you know your job, get the ball in the box. John O'Hare, your job to score me a goal. Simple, he said. He says, and Archie, this is Archie again, he said, uh, he says, they're putting Eddie, Eddie Bailey on you today to kick you off the park. He says, well, I've got news for you and Eddie Bailey. You're not fucking playing. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so that was Cluffy as a manager, yeah? Oh dear. Anyhow, cut a long story short, the uh, chairman of Nottingham Forest rang my wife said, listen, he said, there's no way he's going to sign for, Nottingham, for Derby County. We don't want him to go there. Henry Newton's gone there. Terry Hennessy said, we just can't allow it. So um, that was it, really. It fell through. You know, I mean, I bumped into him once or two, you know, a few times after, and he completely snubbed me. Until about, oh, never spoke to me, hated me. But uh, when I was down the ground with Paul Hart, and working with Paul Hart at Forest, and uh, they had a function, Cluffy was speaking. And we were in a room like this prior to the, going in for the dinner and that, and we are talking to the lads, I think Robbo was there, Ian Bowie, Paul Hart, Liam O'Kane, you know, all the, all the golden oldies. And um, he walked in, Cluffy. But he didn't see me initially, and he's talking to these. And, you know, Robbo and Liam and Paul Hart. He suddenly turns around and sees me. And he came over and he said, Oh, he said, it's you, is it? <laughs> he said, you tell me you're not such a big a shithouse as you used to be. <laughs> and that's, that's the first time I, you know, he spoke to me in about, I don't know, 20 years. So that was how that ended, yeah.
So we so we sat in the bath one day after training again. It was always getting into trouble, Jim. You know, one way or the other. He said, "Oh, he said I got away with it with the missus yesterday." He said, I "Said, wow, what happened, Jim?" He said, "Well, she was washing my trousers." He said, "And uh, this bit bit of bit of paper um, came out my uh, trousers with a woman's name on it, Amanda Jane." So he said, "I thought quickly." He said, "He said, oh, don't worry." He said, "I was at uh, some races yesterday, and it's a tip for a horse." In the next few days, Amanda Jane. Oh, she, oh, she, that's all right. Yeah, that's okay. So about two or three days later, he comes in the dressing room. He's got a huge bump on the top of his head here. I said, I said, what's happened there, Jim? He says, well, I went home yesterday at lunchtime after training. He said, walked in the kitchen. She said she whacked me on the head with a frying pan and said, Jim, your fucking horse is just around. <laughs> <laughs> So that was Jim, and uh, he thought he thought like Jim, he thought like pre-season training Jim was you know like a jolly up. So we, you know when we used to go on his pre-season trains, you know Jim he'd do a bit of training. That was it was you know out on the town at night, and I happened to have to room with him this night. So there was always like bottles of Bacardi in the room, bottles of this beer and all that sort of thing. I said, oh, I'm going out, Jim. Just have a walk around with the lads around the town, and you know, won't be late, won't be. Uh, he said, Oh, he said, I'm. He said, I think I'll have an early night, and I wish it was unusual for Jim. Anyhow, I come back in a couple of hours or so. Went in the room, and there's Jim laid on the bed. He's got one girl this side, one, one girl this side, quite voluptuous, hardly anything on either arm, with her arm round one, a big fag in this hand. He says, Ian, he said. Uh, if the wife finds out about this, he says, I'll be banging trouble. He said, I told her I stopped smoking three months ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, he's, so he was great at the one-liners, Jim. You know, really funny guy, but uh, great player in the past. But uh, unfortunately, he wasn't, uh, you know, when he came to Forest, I think we'd, uh, we'd seen his best days. Well, let's talk about Chief Scouting. You did actually uh, Chief Scout with uh, Martin O'Neill and John Robertson at yeah, Aston yeah, Villa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What were they both like working together as... Um, <clears throat> manager and assistant yeah. well i think they both really got on you know they've both been friends for years and actually played together at forest and um <coughs> you know and been very successful as players and <coughs> i think martin had done a really good job at leicester uh where he took robbo with him and he, he then he went up to Celtic and they were very successful so um i think martin's always wanted me to work with him for quite some time and he, you know and when he got the video job he asked me if i'd go and help him out there so yeah i mean he's really good to work for martin you know he was very enthusiastic very hard working and um, you know he, um, he we, we did sign some quite decent players there I thought you know Ashley Young and people like that James Milner um, Fabian Dale did, did quite well for us and you know bought them at reasonable prices I thought and sold them for quite a lot of money so and, and to be fair to Martin they finished sixth in the league uh, three seasons on the trot but unfortunately the Villa fans didn't think that was good enough so uh, but you know, since he left, I mean, you know, it went the other way, didn't it? To be fair to Martin, so um, yeah, I thought he's um, and you know, him and um, him and Robbo has always got on well, so it was a good partnership. You know, Robbo was very knowledgeable about the game and um, not a coach, but very knowledgeable, John, and um, still still see him every every week, and we go to the games together. So uh, turned out to be a fantastic player, didn't he? But uh, fantastic, yeah. You know, I hope Martin does well at Forest. You know, I mean, it's I thought it's going to be an easy job. I think you know, I think he's. Unfortunately, inherited quite a lot of, I may say, so ordinary players. But uh, I think props come the summer that hopefully that the um, chairman will back him and that um, he will um, he will get some better players and consequently hopefully get back into the Premiership. It'd be great if we could, wouldn't it? I mean, it uh, that's where you need to be, isn't it, these days? Yeah.